let's actually talk about friggin' patents. <laughs> this is like a 30 minute ramble interlude, uh, introduction to, to patents, or as he would say, patents. Um, okay, you will find patents in section 35 of the United States Code. Now run to your local law library and check it out. But if, if you're real interested, that's where you will find it, okay? Patents cover ideas and protect ideas as they are applied to inventions. Um, not just simply the ideas themselves. The ideas have to be used in an inventive way. They have to do something. They're applied to an invention. Um, you receive a monopoly, a limited monopoly of 15 to 20 years. Uh, most patents last 20 years, most utility patents, patents that do stuff last 20 years, but you can also file for a design patent. It's uh, how an article of manufacture looks. For instance, a hammer. A hammer does something. It's pretty much a solid object, but how it looks, you can patent the design of it. You could patent the design of a turntable platter. It's how something looks. Um, and that lasts 15 years, okay? Now, you're given these 15 to 20 years limited monopoly in exchange for making your idea public domain. Again, as I said, your idea is not public domain like we can do whatever we want with it. You just have to make the information known. This is important so that other people may not infringe on your patent. It's also important so other people know how things work so maybe they can do different and new things based upon that. Okay, so the idea is public domain, but in order for you to use it, say I come up with something that's patentable and I get a patent on it, if you want to use it in your in invention, uh, you need to license it from me. That's the important thing. So in all of this, as we'll learn in our next class, uh, permission to use someone's copyrighted works, permission to use someone's trademark on a good, permission to use someone's patented idea in a technology. Permission is a license, it's a contract, okay? It's important to note though, that when you file for a patent, which you may not get, you, you're making that information known. So there's a slight risk in that, and that's why a lot of people may choose the route of trade secrets. Uh, like I said, for things like the recipe for Coca-Cola. Totally patentable, but you want to have a long monopoly on it, so you just, you, you protect it using trade secrets, okay? The important part is this is, a, you have the right to exclude. All you get with a patent is, is not the right to actually execute the patent in a product necessarily, it's the right to exclude others from using the patented idea, because many times, in order for you to use the patented idea in a product or invention, you will infringe on other people's patents or you'll need their patented technology to make it work and so you need to work out an agreement there. But this is right, right? You have to file in every country in which you would like to exploit your patented idea, meaning that uh, territoriality applies just like trademark. So there's no such thing as a worldwide patent. A worldwide patent is essentially you've applied for patent in all of the valuable marketplaces in the United States. I mean, in, in the world, in the United States. Um, you know, if you file for a patent and you file for it in Europe, and let's say that uh, there's already a Dutch patent on that, okay, you cannot exploit uh or you cannot make or sell your patented idea in a good in the Netherlands. Okay, so if someone's filed for it there, you know, someone has a patent, you know, for your software idea in Canada, you won't be able to sell it in Canada. But if you have that patent in the United States, you'll have that monopoly in the United States. Okay, so a worldwide patent essentially means that, you know, You've tried to patent in other, um, in other countries. Um, you can file for what's called a PCT patent, which um, will look and try to file for your patent, your idea 
uh, in 184 uh, countries. And then you have to do what's called nationalizing, which is then you f actually file in those countries, okay? Like I said, it's a right to exclude, not a right to sell, and it's because many times in order for you to make your patentable idea sellable in a product uh, or process or anything, you will need other patented technologies to do that. This is very important. This will be on the test. It's an exclusionary right granted to natural people, meaning this is, uh, you know, corporations cannot apply for a patent. Only human beings can. Um, so there's no corporate authorship in patent. How it works at most companies is, let's say you work at Intel and you're, you know, you're working on a new processor for a computer. Uh, once you've invented it or come up with the patentable idea, uh, Intel will file for the patent on your behalf, listing you as inventor. You uh, will be awarded the patent, which will then be assigned to Intel. Uh, and you'll be paid, you know, it's part of like your, your pay, right? It's all in, the, all in your contract. Uh, at universities, um, faculty who come up with patentable ideas, um, and again, whether the idea was come up with uh, on your own at your house or using um, university tools, um, the University of Oregon and most universities will, you know, when you file for a patent, let's say you come up with something that's patentable, a new, a new, uh, a new, you know, process or new software or a, a new, uh, you know, chemical compound or whatever, uh, you file for the patent, you're awarded the patent as inventor, and then you must assign the patent to the university and you'll be paid royalties from the university. Again, this will all be in a contract and it's different for all institutions, but you know, you have companies like Intel or Nike who well, basically, you know, have you sign a contract that says, you know, anything you make on your own time, in your own lab, using your own resources, uh, you know, you'll have to assign that patent to us up to five years after you leave the company. Okay, but it's pretty standard that if, you, if you're a grad student or a student at a university in a science department and you come up with something that is uh, patentable and you're awarded a patent, you will have to assign that to the university, which is why Universities like ours are pushing for sciences because sciences, hard sciences, um, number one, bring in big grants and universities skim off the top of the grant. So if I'm awarded a half million dollar grant, a university will skim, you know, 10 or 20 or 30 or a large percentage off of the top. So that makes the university money. And then if you use that for some type of research and come up with something that's patentable, uh, then the university will uh, be the assignee. They will, be, they, will, they will essentially own the patent. You'll be listed as inventor. So there's no corporate authorship. There is no fair use. It'd be really hard for you to use someone's technology saying, oh, I'm just commenting on it and critiquing it. This is a parody invention. Um, okay. Uh, as I said, employees must uh, assign the patent to the company they work for. This is very, very standard at most companies, even if it's on their own time with their own resources. Um, you know, as I said, it's a limited property right that lasts for 15 years for design patents and 20 years for, uh, for seed patents, utility patents, etc. cetera. Um, and the scope of your patent, what it, what it covers, what it can do, uh, what it ext extends to is in your wrapper, which is your, your document that you submit to the United States Patent and Trademark Office. It has like the drawings and it has like the claims of what the invention does and it lists the prior art, like things that influenced it. 